Welcome everyone uh, to the first hot lunch of the year. Um, I, it's, it's such a joy to actually hear all the conversations and the buzz of just people all gathered together. So uh, thank you for coming to the first hot lunch of the year. Um, I'm Henry Yu, I'm the principal here as well as uh, one of the members of the hot lunch committee. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that again, some of us are joining Hot Lunch Day on Zoom. So um, hopefully you can hear and everything's good. And this is not a flattering angle on me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna acknowledge that right away that uh, I don't look as good on Zoom as, uh, as I would like to, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept that. Um, so again, you're all here in person, which is again, a joy after a long uh, period of, of pandemic. Um, so again, just wanted to be thankful for that and to be also thankful that and acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral traditional territory of the Musqueam. Um, here at St. John's, we, we have the Musqueam flag above us to remind us of where we are um, and who you know, has tended to this land for uh, time immemorial. Uh, behind me is a a print uh, made by the great um, Musqueam artist Susan Point uh, called Salmon People, which again reminds us that, you know, we are gathered uh, around the table sharing food. Our motto at St. John's College um, is the world around our table. We have 165 international graduate students from over 40 different countries. Uh, if there's a flag up, it means that someone has come from there if it's a country, it doesn't have to be a United Nations recognized country. Uh, you'll see flags that are uh, places that have been colonized, that are, are places that people feel they belong to, even though it isn't recognized uh, or they are under someone else's uh, political control. Uh, there are pride flags. So if you don't feel like you are identifying with a place, a nation, um, then we, we are happy to put up a flag that you identify with. So that part of uh, our ethic of being inclusive of the people who come to, to create, bringing people together to create a world and hopefully to also create a better world is one of the reasons why Hot Lunch exists. You know, we're going into our 10th year next year. So it's been 10 years of this. Uh, for some of you, uh, how many of this, is this the first Hot Lunch you've been to? Okay, so still quite a few. Um, so again, uh, we're so glad that you're, you're joining us. Um, the original idea to have hot lunch, um, and I'll acknowledge the committee, uh, Stacy Barber, Jennifer Liu, Joanna Yang from St. John's College, uh, Eilish Courtney, uh, the liaison from Musqueam and UBC Special Projects and retired from events and ceremonies after decades as UBC staff. Um, Sort of, I'm calling out her age, I think. That's probably inappropriate somehow. But she's retired, so that you can already guess that she's been here a while. Um, Andrew Parr, uh, who is the uh, Associate Vice President of Student Housing and Community Services, uh, who is, we used to call Shush because it's S-H-H-S, and now can't figure out whether it's Shucks or Shicks or, just, 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 just Shush is good. There's no vowels, and so we're gonna count C as a vowel. So uh, Andrew's here. He's been a, a long time member of the Hot Lunch Committee. Uh, we have Shori Nakata, ombudsperson for students at UBC. Um, and uh, joining us, we're very happy, is Cheryl Dumaresk, who's managing director of the Office of the Vice Provost International, will also be joining. Um, and so we want to hear your suggestions, those you've just started, on uh, what you like, what you'd love to see. Uh, we've had speakers, and we've had one particular speaker open, you know, hot lunch every September, every year since he's been here since 2016. And so we're both sad that this will be President Ono's last hot lunch with us. And yet we're very grateful to him at St. John's, but also as people who work you know, at UBC, uh, who learn at UBC, who call this place, you know, well, the most important for me place in my life. I was an undergraduate here. I live here as principal. So I'm a resident of UBC campus, but also as an administrator. Um, it's, you know, it's a life calling and a passion to work at UBC. Um, I think for many staff here, that is also something that they also believe, you also believe. And so the hot lunch is for you. It's a way to meet you know, important people on campus, but it's not 
important to meet them because they're important. They're decision makers, some of them. They may be doing things that are really important in terms of new initiatives, you know, something that we should know about because it's uh, making our campus and our workplace a better place. Right? So next month, we'll have Jerry Chen, who's the new Associate Vice uh, President in Human Resources, and he's going to be sharing this new position and what he's doing and who he is, because that's one of the things we've always asked our hot lunch speakers is, who are you if you're new to the campus? Why are you here? What brings you here? Why do you want to do this job? We don't want to hear because of the money. Um, we want to hear what's the passion that makes you want to be at UBC doing this job? And so again, we hope that that kind of sharing over the last 10 years has been useful and important. Hot Lunch has been cited the last three, I think four times as one of the reasons why UBC is one of the best employers in the British Columbia. You may agree or disagree with that designation, but I hope you'll agree that Hot Lunch is something <laughs> worth uh, doing, um, worth keeping. Um, I know that sounds like so we're not, we're gonna get our funding cut or something, and then you have to, you know, this worth keeping. Uh, no worries, uh, this is a good thing. Uh, we're not gonna cut it. Um, so we know that Santa Ono is going to Michigan and I should get out of the way because I know that's why you're, many of you are here. Uh, the food's great, uh, but now you're here to hear from uh, President Ono for one last time. Um, we wish him well at St. John's as he goes to uh, Michigan. He won't have to change his colors of clothing and things like that. So it's blue and gold so you can see he can keep his jacket. Um, but I, again, we're gonna be sad because he has really given a lot to UBC in terms of being an empathetic leader, someone who has listened, taken lots of selfies with so many students, staff and, uh, and faculty. Uh, I think the tweeting count was over 20,000 during his time here. Um, and that reflects, I think, something that he brought to hot lunch each year and that I'm a, a particularly grateful for, which is he wasn't uh, afraid to also hear that there was issues and problems and that <coughs> as our leader, he should you know, do what he could, which was to bring people and empower them to make changes. You know, One person can't change the university, but one person can empower those who want to you know, make changes for the better. And so uh, we believe at, at SJC, as we do, I think at UBC, that bringing people together to make the world better is, is a mission beyond your own job description. It comes under that title for a lot of the stuff that says, and other duties to, has required. Uh, making the world a better place is a, a duty as, uh, as required. And so I'd like to now welcome uh, President Ono. Thank him personally for all he's done that he, that he and Wendy have done for, for moving forward things that we believe in at St. John's. Um, and again, on behalf of all of you, I hope to give a warm, Final welcome uh, to President Ono to Hot Lunch. It's really wonderful to be with you again. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, just listening to the history of the Hot Lunch, you know, this is the seventh year I've been here, uh, the beginning of the seventh year. And so, the hot lunch wasn't going on that long before I arrived, which is, uh, I thought it was going on for centuries or something like that because of the energy and the passion of everybody attending hot lunch. So um, for me, uh, attending this lunch virtually for during the pandemic was something that reinvigorated me on a regular basis and brought me in contact with all of you. And some of you have been here every single year um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moment to look forward to on an annual basis uh, to reconnect. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to work with several of you uh, directly. And I can tell you that uh, you have inspired me over the years and uh, um, all the things that have occurred at this great institution uh, during the six and a half years, none of it would have been possible without each and every one of you. So the first thing I want to say is just uh, thank you for everything that you've done. Um, I'm incredibly proud of what's happened with this institution over this period of time. And I hope you are as well, because it was a, a collaborative team effort of everybody in this room and 
uh, all 16 or 17,000 employees and students who are employees and faculty um, and alumni of this institution that have been responsible for, for all that has been accomplished during, let's face it, as they say, unprecedented times. Um, and uh, it seems like we're starting to hopefully uh, work our way out of that. Um, we still have challenges, as you know, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic still upon us. Um, but um, I hope you're proud of the role that UBC has played uh, on the scientific and policy front uh, to really play an outsized role in how we're dealing with the pandemic. You know, for me, it's incredibly bittersweet, to be very honest and upfront to be moving on to, to the University of Michigan. I'll tell you why. One of you actually showed me a photograph of, uh, that, that he took when he was walking by a road called President's Row in Acadia Park. And I think probably some of you have actually walked past that uh, rock as well. And if you, if you stop for a moment and look at that rock, you can see or you can appreciate why this university means so much to me. Uh, some of you may know that my father was a professor of mathematics in the late 50s uh, until 1963 uh, here at UBC. And um, they were immigrants uh, to first the United States and then to Canada. And while he was a professor of mathematics at UBC, uh, he already had my older brother, Mamoro. But then my mother uh, and my father had me on the UBC campus uh, in Acadia place uh, on President's Row. And uh, every now and then I go back there uh, to remember how foundational this university, this city, this place has been not only to my life, but to the life of my entire family. And that's what drew, drew me back here um, when I was invited to consider the presidency of uh, the University of British Columbia from Cincinnati. And I have to tell you that I've been blown away uh, by the energy of this institution, by the creativity and passions of faculty, staff, and students, uh, and alumni of this institution. Over the years, I've been able to come back in that almost 60 year period since when I was born here on this campus and raised here as a little toddler. Um, and uh, what's happened to this institution since that time is, as many some of you may know, simply extraordinary. Um, that area is now burgeoning and um, there's an uh, entire development called Nalem that's going up. Uh, I think it's Nalem. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, some of my, my old townhouse is still there on President's Road. And across, across the way was where Joy Kogawa lived. Uh, she was there at the same time on President's Row. And, but if you look around, um, the explosion uh, in the entire uh, physical plan of this institution, uh, the expansion to include the Okanagan campus, which is also uh, an incredible success beyond the dreams of what uh, the government and this institution thought was possible when the Okanagan campus became part of, of UBC. Um, and just the uh, trajectory of this institution and everything it does in terms of academics and uh, the success of students and faculty and staff here is something that probably was unimaginable 60 years ago uh, when I was born here in Vancouver. And the times that every time I come back and would visit the university, every time I was blown away. And uh, when you speak with alumni that visit the institution or students who come back, recent graduates even, they all remark to me that it's, it's truly uh, remarkable uh, that this pace of growth and the ascent of the institution has continued unabated, uh, regardless of uh, the challenges that have been thrown in the way of this institution and all the people that make up uh, this university. Uh, it's, uh, I remember coming back here, I think in around 1996 or so, when I was considering uh, taking a, 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 a CRC chair here. And uh, at that time, the Life Sciences Institute, if I recall correctly, was recently built. And a lot of the amazing buildings around the LSI were still going up. It looked like a construction zone back then. The, I don't think that the Taft building was yet built and uh, now it's fully built. And new buildings are, are being built uh, as we speak 
many new buildings. If you actually look at the skyline, if you will, of UBC, you will see at least six cranes. Um, and many of those are academic buildings. And uh, we're incredibly proud that as an institution, all of us have come together to really build upon the foundation of what is truly a remarkable institution to make it even better. And I'll get into some of those buildings in a second, but um, I just wanted to first start by saying it's bittersweet. Um, it meant a lot for me to come back here. Um, and uh, it means a lot uh, to me that we have collaborated uh, on all of these initiatives together. Um, and it means a lot to me that uh, we have navigated this pandemic together during these unprecedented times. If you don't mind, I'm gonna take off my jacket, it's getting a little bit warm, especially, <laughs> especially underneath that spotlight there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about how we got to where we are today. And you are all architects of, of this plan. You'll remember one of the first things that we did together was to have a conversation, which is kind of the way things are done here at UBC. And you should be very proud of how you go about making these plans and these pathways to make the institution a better place, to make uh, the world a better place. Um, and if you remember, the first thing that we did as an institution was to have a dialogue to think about what would be our values, what would be uh, our strategic direction as an institution, so that regardless of what faculty or what institute or what department you're in, that uh, you had an opportunity to provide input towards that direction. So I just wanna remind you that that's what we did. And we had uh, town hall meetings on both campuses over a span of several months. And uh, recognizing that we had just celebrated as an institution, the centennial, centennial of the university, we called that strategic plan shaping UBC's next century. And some of you may know that uh, I commissioned a book, which I hope that you'll read. Um, it's in the library, you can find it in a bookstore. Uh, and it really tells a remarkable story of the first hundred years of University of British Columbia. And it told a story about that first hundred years and how things weren't always easy. Talks about the great trek, the passions of the students, asking the province to create a great research university here in Vancouver. It illustrates the power of activism and advocacy from the youngest members of this institution that I can tell you in my remarks in a few moments really shaped how we actually worked together over this six and a half years. So that process of developing the strategic plan, which is still in force, which I shall hand to the acting president and the 16th president, president of UBC is something that we co-created. And it's sort of a roadmap as it's meant to be, something that's a living document that changes depending upon the resources that are available, depending upon things that are unpredictable that come our way that will require our collective attention and energy. It's been enforced now for several years and I can tell you that what's remarkable is that the university has really come together. Having worked at other institutions, I can tell you that sometimes strategic plans are created and they sit there, that there's no resource allocated to it. Um, and that if you look across the institution, whether you have nine faculties or 10 faculties or 19 schools and colleges, depending upon which university we're talking about, it's pretty rare that that process of co-creating a roadmap really brings the institution together. Uh, and I think the biggest evidence that that happened were, were first of all, what happened in terms of the unit plans, the faculties themselves. Um, we went from a place where some of the faculties didn't have plans, some of them had to renew plans, to a, a situation right now where every single faculty at this institution has a strategic plan that mirrors the priorities and values that we co-created together across both campuses. So it's more than a roadmap, it's something that galvanized and united the institution as it should be, because universities are great because there's tremendous disciplinary strength, but they become 
most impactful when there's interdisciplinary activity and this cross fertilization between faculty and students and staff and alumni that whose home base might be one of those faculties. The true innovation occurs at those boundaries. They occur in classrooms and laboratories, but they also occur when you gather together over a meal, such as this hot lunch. And that's why it's so wonderful for me to be with you today in a manifestation of the power of a university, the hot lunch, where individuals from different faculties, and different units come together, break bread, eat rice, whatever it might be uh, served on that occasion, to talk honestly about what's exciting, what's challenging, and how coming together, we can build upon this great institution and make it even better for the students, faculty and staff of today, but also perhaps in a very unselfish and selfless way for those who will follow us, which is one of the most remarkable things about an institution is that its impact will outlive all of us. And the work that we put into the institution will benefit those that we may not even know today. So beyond having a roadmap and resulting or catalyzing the formation of plans across each of the faculties, mirroring those values and those priorities. The strategic plan also, this one was new in that for the first time, it wasn't an aspirational plan. You know, uh, the previous uh, place and promise plan was fantastic. It had great values um, and a lot was accomplished. But if I look back and look at the budgets of previous years, there weren't large amounts of resource that were actually put behind each of the priorities. I wanna congratulate all of you, all the deans and all of you in each of the units for actually within the faculties and also centrally uh, within the institution, uh, it, it really for the first time, allocating resource to drive forward the priorities within the faculties and the priorities within the institution. And if you actually look at it, it's pretty staggering how much resource has been put towards this strategic plan. It's because of that, that I think that we have been remarkably successful, successful especially in the context of this pandemic uh, that we have uh, been experiencing. So we made historic uh, investments in the number of faculty at this university. And, to support them, new seats were uh, created for studentships uh, in programs that these faculty members have led and created. Um, and um, new staff were recruited to support all the activities of these research active faculty or faculty that are focused on teaching and creating uh, new ways of, of sharing new knowledge. To just give you some sort of an idea of the magnitude of that, if you look across the institution, hundreds of new net new faculty have been recruited to the institution and hundreds more will be recruited to this institution in the future, reversing a, a decline in the number of, of full-time research active faculty at this institution that had been going down over some period of time. This was accomplished by leveraging a number of different programs, some from the federal government, some created within institution, with the, with the resource that was invested to drive the strategic plan. Um, and some are still ongoing uh, through uh, these programs, the President's Excellence Chairs. If you actually think across your faculties, you'll see really um, outstanding faculty that have been recruited across all the faculties on both campuses that are building research teams. In some cases where new buildings are being built to support themselves and the their colleagues that they're recruiting to the institution, for example, the School of Biomedical Engineering, uh, that kind of focused recruitment through these CHAIRS programs, the Canada 150 program, the CRCs, and most recently the President's Academic Excellence Initiative, or PAEI, that's uh, in front of you, in front of your own eyes, uh, the evidence of the investments that are being made along uh, the priorities that were articulated in the strategic plan. So that's because uh, tens of millions of dollars, even more than that, were allocated and put behind the strategic plan so that we could really have maximal impact 
uh, on becoming an even stronger research university and one where we not only build disciplinary strength across all the faculties and, and, and departments, but also catalyze interdisciplinary activity between uh, faculty, staff, and students of different faculties. And it's been remarkable. The number of uh, what we call global uh, research excellence uh, clusters uh, has uh, grown over the six, six and a half years, uh, where we now have uh, four uh, such uh, uh, globally excellent uh, research clusters that are by definition in the top two or three in the world. At the same time, you can see the impact of this on our students. We've gone now to a, a state where we regularly have Rhodes Scholars. We even had one year where we had two Rhodes Scholars in the very same year. And I'm incredibly proud that one of those Rhodes Scholars was actually based at the Okanagan campus. You will also have noticed that the number of students has gone up during this time, although it's plateauing strategically. We now have more than 71,000 FTEs enrolled on both campuses, and we remain the most international university in North America. And a lot of uh, people have discussed uh, why that's something to be proud of. I can tell you that in my view, in this uh, period of geopolitical tension, this is a time to build bridges between nations. More importantly than ever before, it's important to bring people from all of these countries represented by these flags together to share their cultures, their languages, their dreams, their historical context so that we can develop global citizens that will work together to bring peace to this planet. You know, I think uh, if you look at my social media, Instagram or, or Twitter, you'll see that um, I'll be participating in this uh, global dialogue in a few days called Waging Peace. And one of the things that I'm most proud about in terms of our strategic plan and this intentional uh, effort to bring people together across disciplines and from different nations is that that's gonna be integral in what, I, what I'm gonna say at this uh, uh, international conversation that will include Jane Goodall and uh, Wade Davis uh, and myself and, and, and some others is that more importantly than ever before, we must commit to building bridges between nations when the uh, safety and peace that we've taken for granted is at threat. I've talked to you a little bit about some major uh, initiatives that have uh, occurred uh, during the six and a half years here. Talk to you about the School of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, you can see the hole in the ground. Um, yeah. You can see it uh, where the COP building used to be, will emerge uh, an architectural gem uh, and the home of uh, a dynamic group of individuals led by Peter Zanstra. He's already recruited uh, many world-class scientists to that School of Biomedical Engineering. The cohorts of students that are based there are simply outstanding, but that's not all. On top of that, there are, are new homes for the School of Kinesiology and nursing. I can tell you, I've looked at the plans. They're gonna be the best, second to none, anywhere in the world in terms of those facilities to support these programs that are globally ranked of which we are very proud. And you probably saw the Brock Commons towers that are going up. Some of those will be residence halls, rooms, 600 greatly needed um, uh, beds for our students. We need them desperately, even though we've added thousands during the six and a half years, and none of that would have happened without you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and uh, we need more. And and I know that moving, I know that moving forward, Andrew and and my my successor will plan that. And I, I'm sure that they will be first class, just like the other residence halls that uh, have uh, been erected with your vision and your team's hard work. Uh, it's really, I got to tell you, remarkable what's happened at this institution. Uh, I can tell you that uh, at the University of Michigan, we wanna also build uh, residence hall rooms, but uh, the number that they're talking about is uh, probably twofold less of what Andrew and his team was able to accomplish in a very short period of time. Let's hear it for Andrew and everything he's doing. Beyond that, some of you probably know that there are other buildings going up. 
um, the Brock Commons uh, uh, complex. Uh, you saw a beautiful uh, cylindrical student arts, uh, uh, student union center, student arts, st arts student center, sorry, that if you recall, was a little bit of a controversial topic because remember it was supposed to actually be built in what's called the Bosque, all those trees that are, that are between the nest and the, the um, IKB. And there was, uh, I was flooded with all kinds of uh, tweets and social media uh, tags because of, of some distinguished people, probably some of you saying, don't cut down the trees. Um, and it was not simple because we were about to move forward with that building. Um, and there were students uh, who had invested a lot of time and energy who I care about uh, deeply, who were very disappointed that it was delayed uh, for some period of time. Um, but ultimately, uh, when we found a different location where it is today, uh, near Brock Commons too, uh, fortunately the students said, that's where we wanted it in the first place. <laughs> so um, it's now up, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and uh, the Brock Commons complex, in addition to having um, re residence hall uh, contributions much needed, also has a uh, new space for the Faculty of Arts, the Allard School of Law, and also student services. Um, and one important component of it, the entire floor, is going to be focused on something that has been a priority for me, that is the wellness and mental health of, of faculty, staff, and students at this institution. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, we have about nearly doubled the amount of resource that we put into that. Uh, it's especially important uh, during this pandemic because it's been tough to be virtual and remote in all that we do. Uh, in addition to that, you probably know that um, there um, is, uh, in addition to the gate, a gateway building for kinesiology and nursing. Uh, there's gonna be a, a, one of the largest buildings ever built uh, on the Okanagan campus, the Interdisciplinary uh, Teaching and Research Center that was just approved at the board um, earlier this week. There have been a historic addition of 11 residence halls on both campuses that will ensure that several thousand more students a year can live uh, in what I think is one of the most vibrant and largest residential campuses in North America, isn't that correct? pretty remarkable. One of those uh, was groundbreaking. You'll remember Tollwood House, an 18-story LEED Gold certified 404-bed uh, residence hall, which uh, was, or probably still is, the world's tallest mass wood tim uh, timber tower uh, built uh, in the world. And I can tell you that wherever I go, people know about Tollwood House. And I can tell you that the Ohio State University and that's hard for me to say since I've gone to Michigan, <laughs> um, that the president of Ohio State University uh, said, you know, that Tallwood House and that uh, approach to sustainability is something that every university should uh, copy in terms of their approaches to a campus as a living lab. Another concept, another model that was pioneered at UBC and uh, is going to be uh, copied around the world. You know, I've talked too long, so I'm gonna just touch upon a couple of things that uh, mean a great deal to me beyond uh, the relationships that Wendy and I and my daughters and my dog Romeo will always cherish uh, here at UBC. Beyond the investments in faculty and the recruitment of additional students through new seats, building of new buildings to support uh, these individuals. And I, I, I need to say that in addition to the ICI building gateway um, that you probably, and, and this biomedical uh, engineering building, that you can look forward to a new tower at the Sauter School of Business. Um, and uh, although it's not yet complete, that it's very likely that you will see uh, a new building uh, in uh, applied science. Uh, and um, um, there will be a doubling in space of the Biodiversity Museum. It's, it's stunning what you have accomplished uh, at this institution. Be proud, because all of that is because of your uh, insight, planning. Um, some of you have raised money for that. Some of you have raised money for the largest ever uh, increase in scholarship support for our students, the Blue and Gold Campaign uh, for uh, students that raised $217 million uh, for new scholarships for thousands of students at this institution. The gift of a UBC education has become possible because of your hard work and I salute you for everything that you've done. Now on top of that, beyond those scholarships, 
you probably know that uh, five of the years that we've worked together have been the most successful fundraising years in the history of this institution, bringing in $1.4 billion to this university, being the cornerstone to the $3 billion campaign that I called Forward that we just launched a couple of days ago. And we will meet that target ahead of schedule, I believe. So the last thing I'm gonna say, I've spoken a lot, and I hope you're proud of what we've done together, are two things that Henry talked about. And I was interviewed on the radio station yesterday. They asked me, what are you most proud of? Most proud of recruitment of faculty or recruitment of exceptional students and um, recruitment of outstanding staff to the institution? And I said, all of those things I'm proud of. But they said, you gotta choose one thing. And so the one thing that I said, that I was most proud of is how this community came together through difficult conversations to talk about the culture of the university. And if, if you think about and ask leaders, what's the most difficult thing to try to tackle? It's not raising a lot of money or building new programs or building new buildings. Those things happen at every university. But the most difficult thing that you have accomplished that I'm grateful for is having those conversations about how to make this very diverse institution a more inclusive one, where we tackle systemic racism of every form, every form of discrimination, where we commit together as an institution to inclusive excellence. I gotta tell you, that work was hard. And many of you were engaged in that work. And I sincerely appreciate the fact that you invested in that process and the outcome has been something that's already having an impact on this institution, the culture of this university where each and every person here feels embraced and part of the great university that we have before us. Everyone feels that they belong. We're not quite there yet, but the work that you have done is a roadmap to that dream, if you will. Take a look at the Airy Task Force report. It's stunning. And everywhere I go, people talk about that almost 395 page report with 54 recommendations of which a first tranche is already being acted upon with the creation of new scholarship programs like the Beyond Tomorrow Scholars Program, the creation of new centers that are focusing, focused on addressing racism in every sector of society. Be proud of the fact that you created that, number one. And think about what we did together in apologizing for our role in the Indian residential schools. It's something that's recognized around the world that we as an institution apologize for our role in that example, horrible example of colonization. It was the first step in this institution's truth and reconciliation process. And upon that, we didn't stop there. Together, we created an indigenous strategic plan that is read and discussed around the world, at the United Nations, at every university. I spoke about it at the University of Pennsylvania just a few months ago. And it's not just an aspirational plan. We're already moving on those. We've allocated $4 million this year to projects led by faculty, staff, and students, indigenous led, to do our part to meet our commitments to the United Nations uh, recommendations of rights of indigenous people or UNDRA. And I'm gonna end by saying, because Henry is here, and the last thing I'm gonna say is that in thinking about all different aspects of Racism, um, one of the, I guess, the most formative aspects of my time here has been being comfortable with the fact that as an Asian leader, that it's okay for me to also consider racism against Asian people. And I wanna thank everybody here who was involved in the national dialogue on anti-Asian racism. And some of you may know that Unfortunately, British Columbia and Vancouver was during our time labeled sort of the 
capital of anti-Asian racism. And so I salute everybody here who was involved in that effort. The output of that work, which was difficult, is also gonna be foundational to what we do as an institution, to making sure that uh, Asian Canadians and Asians from elsewhere in the world feel safe, supported, and feel a belonging in being part of this institution. So the last thing I'm gonna say in terms of student activism, I've talked way too long, I promise it's gonna be the last one, <laughs> is something that is incredibly important. And that strategic plan, I began with the strategic plan, is focused on how we can leverage the tremendous talents of this institution, the faculty, staff, and students, to try to confront the most vexing existential problems in the world. And if you think about it, if you think about the tremendous floods and the heat domes and the unpredictable weather that's affecting us around the globe, climate change is something that we have taken ownership of as an institution in a way that other universities are watching. And they're impressed. And I wanna give a shout out to the students of this institution and the faculty and staff who were urging this university's administration for many years to take action, to divest from fossil fuels, to actually develop a compre comprehensive plan where we could teach and do research to address this problem that really uh, is so existential that it uh, challenges or threatens our very existence as a civilization. I'm very proud because of that activism, activism from students, faculty and staff that we have taken the lead uh, in making sure that UBC will be at the center and be a leader uh, in addressing this and other existential problems. I've spoken way too long and I promised that I was gonna answer any questions and I hope we have time for a question, do we? Yes. Um, and, <laughs> and, and we're gonna dispense with this Slido business you can just ask me whatever questions that you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Santa. Thank you. I, I know you're apologizing again and again for uh, taking so long, but I think that's why people came today was to hear from you. Um, again, every time I say one last time, it, it feels like we're at a wake or something, but you're not, you're not dying. You're just going to Michigan. Um, so, um, so I, I want to uh, do one thing before we go on to question and answers, which is to give a, a parting gift. Um, and this is uh, from St. John's, but also specifically um, in honor of your opening hot lunch. Every you you were here right from the beginning. It's a bowl, um, a simple bowl, kind of blue and goldish, actually. Um, and it's a single bowl, so you, you can't actually have something with Wendy unless you want to share the same bowl. Um, but, so we could have gotten two bowls, uh, now that I think about it, but um, sorry, Wendy. Yeah. Um, so we've got you a bowl uh, as a symbol, actually, of this gathering over food each year. Um, this, you could consider, even though it's a ceramic bowl, so please don't drop it, but it is like, a, as long as you have this bowl, you're welcome to come home here to share a meal with us. Uh, Thank you. Wherever you go, Michigan, any other place. Um, in China, this would be an iron rice bowl. And so you could like, you always get fed with the iron rice bowl because you can't break it. You can break this one, but there, that fragility I hope is also about the, the care we need to put into the bonds we make with each other, whether in our workplace, with our family, friends, your dog. Um, but those are fragile relationships and they are tended to by feeding each other, sharing, conversations difficult and and maybe funny and easy and uh, sustaining therapeutic over a meal and that's what this place stands for this is what it's meant to us as as UBC faculty staff and students to have you break bread share rice stew whatever it is that uh, that chef uh, Clarence and chef Seifu have, have made for us and so you're welcome to come always to again uh, join the world around our table, the world that we're making here today, you know, together as we hear from you one last time. So uh, thank you, President Ono, thank for you. this. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.
lets you uh, field questions directly from the audience. And I know some of you need to return to work at, at one. Some of you may already have needed to return to work and, and you're already playing hooky, but um, happy <laughs> to answer any questions. Maybe we do need a slide up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. It's, it was, it's the whole team. It's all of us together. And I'm so happy about the Gateway Building. You, I remember I was there outside the nest and uh, when a lot of people were coming to me. I don't know if it was then, but even then, some, somebody from nursing said, we need a new building. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled that that's happening. Kinesiology is one of the best. It's the best in Canada, one of the best programs in the world. And they're getting a much deserved building so they can centralize a lot of their classrooms and, and laboratories in one place. So I'm, I'm really, really happy. So thank you for remembering that. Please. What's kind of your takeaway? Well, I gotta tell you when I first arrived at UBC to be frank, uh, I knew very little about First Nations and indigeneity and uh, I've learned a great deal uh, working directly with uh, First Nations, with Musqueam, the community and, uh, and other, other indigenous uh, groups here in BC and also here in the Lower Mainland, also in, in the Okanagan. Um, and I learned a lot from Cheryl Lightfoot and uh, everybody that was involved, the, the hundreds of people that were involved in creating the indigenous strategic plan. I still have more to learn but I believe that I can bring all of that knowledge to the University of Michigan. They are at least 10 years behind and they admit it uh, compared to UBC. They're just thinking about land acknowledgements, which is fine, it's the first step. But um, that's an example when I say that UBC is really a thought leader. Uh, and uh, you know, it's quite bold for, for UBC to be the, the first university to commit to UNDRIP. Um, and I think UBC played a very important role in BC being the first province uh, to commit to that as well. Uh, so uh, and it's, it's, it's been relevant not only in terms of uh, uh, truth and reconciliation in terms of indigenous people, but uh, it's uh, the, the lessons that have been learned through that translate to uh, power imbalances and uh, uh, discrimination and racism uh, around the world. Um, they're common themes. And uh, whether you're talking about what happened uh, with African Americans and slavery, uh, whether you're talking about the internment of Japanese Canadians, um, there's, there's the same lessons that you can learn from that kind of focused um, initiative, uh, which are actually led by the individuals who have been impacted by that systemic racism. So. I thank you as a university for educating me uh, on that. I also wanna thank my wife, Wendy, because when I was completely obsessed with, uh, with being a research scientist and getting promoted and getting grants and getting tenure, uh, the, uh, I, can, I can tell you honestly that uh, Wendy was all in uh, decades ago. Um, you know, she, she and I met at McGill University in Montreal um, and uh, she and I were both scientists and she could have gone to medical school. Um, but I remember, um, I think there were two reasons why she didn't go to school. She got into U of T, uh, which is quite an achievement, but she also got into Boston University Law School and uh, she had to make a decision. Uh, and uh, I was going to Boston and so I hope one of the reasons was so that she could be with me. <laughs> I was going to Harvard. Uh, but the other reason I remember is that she said one evening, 
I really care about justice. I really care. Sorry about that. And she, she really did it. Uh, she did it. She went to law school and um, she graduated from law school. She went into patent law. I'm sorry about this. And she became a, um, a legal fellow, the Anheuser Bush legal fellow, um, focused on um, addressing some of racism, anti Asian racism. Um, I'm very proud of what she committed to, and she's still doing it today. Um, some of you know that she's been very involved in um, ACAM and, um, and her own initiative um, in, in, a, in a virtual museum called PCHC. And I learned a lot from her. And um, I'm sorry this has happened. This is the third time I've cried. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Please don't make me cry again. <laughs> At UBC, always a long list. <laughs> uh, obviously, the people is at the very top of the list. I mean, we've done so many things together, you know, as a university, all the work, but also all the fun. And I have the privilege of having dinner with many of you. <laughs> uh, raising our kids together. <laughs> Sorry. Um, playing music together. Well, I'm gonna miss all the people more than anything else. Sorry about that. <laughs> no more questions don't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me change the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The funniest thing that made me laugh. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll tell you some, some other memories uh, were, um, you know, I was incredibly honored that um, Department of Recreation Athletics, um, they, I don't know if you know, but they, they were crazy. I think they had an insane moment where they decided to induct me into the UBC Sports Hall of Fame. <laughs> I, I have no idea how I belong there <laughs> with Olympians and NHL players and Major League players and baseball, I don't know, the CFL players, but for some reason, and I'm incredibly honored, it's, it, it's, I just, I'm speechless that that happened. And I'll, I'll still, I'm still pinching myself that that happened. Um, and it's not the funniest thing, but, you know, one of the things that Caviatour said was that he said, um, you know, that I showed up, we showed up games, Wendy and I showed up games with the family. Um, he said that, um, I was the first president to do Storm the Wall, first president to do with Wendy, um, the day of the longboat. But I guess the funniest thing was that uh, I thought that I could really contribute to the team and uh, Storm the Wall. And, uh, and, you know, I'm almost 60 years old. You know? <laughs> and so I was probably, um, I don't know, what, what would that be, uh, 53 or something? <laughs> And so I, I had this, this moment where I felt that I could cycle as fast as a 20 year old kid. <laughs> and so one of the legs of, of uh, Storm of the Wall, because you go to swim and you have to run, you have to sprint, you ride a bicycle. So I was given the task of riding a bicycle round and around Main Mall. And I was going really fast trying to compete with the, with the students. And by the time I got, went down the hill, as you know, towards the nest in the plaza, 
where the wall is there and everybody's watching me, right? Because they were they were like hyping it up that Santa is coming. <laughs> oh no, no, not pause. I'm talking. <laughs> that I was so tired, my my legs didn't even work, and somehow everybody was watching me. I could barely get to the wall, <laughs> much less climb it. And so I don't know if you call that a funny moment or a sad moment, but but Cabby actually reached down and they literally pulled me up the wall. <laughs> so I'd say that's one of the funniest moments. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming and sharing, and thank you, Amaki, for uh, for actually perhaps shifting it to a warm feeling as we leave, um, rather than just sadly warm. And many of you wrote comments. Uh, they are uh, thank you to Stacy and the, the staff. They put them in a booklet, so it's it's in here with the ball from the comments. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, those of you who wrote comments. Uh, uh, we, we can also share them with others who are here uh, at the Hot Lunch website. And if, money, if you don't want that, just let Stacy quietly know. Uh, we're gonna, we want to, um, as part of the warm send off to a very cold Ann Arbor, I've been there in December, uh, you'll need this warmth. Why don't we try to take one photo uh, in the uh, Santa Ono president self, selfie tradition. Um, we'll get him with everybody here. Okay, okay.